Okay, let's get started. Just to make it easy, I'm just sharing my screen today. So as I go along, we can just go to the different slides without me having to swap between screens. Okay, so there's three topics we want to cover today, um, or two topics we want to cover and possibly go through the questions that I posted last week on Thursday. So first topic that we're doing is DNA replication. Okay, DNA replication is where DNA um, makes a copy of itself. It replicates itself. So that's what we're doing with DNA replication. It's just making a copy of DNA. So what does CAPS need us to know about DNA replication? We must know about the process of DNA replication, uh, but we must be careful not to go into too much detail with it. Uh, there's, for example, a lot of um, enzymes uh, that are involved in this process. They do not need us to know about the enzymes involved in the process. They just need us to know about the process itself. When the cells, uh, when in the cell cycle does it take place? We're going to see that it takes place during interphase. Um, and then where in the cell does it take place? We're going to see that because DNA is inside the nucleus, or we're mainly working with the nuclear DNA, that we're going to uh, it's going to be taking place in the nucleus. Um, how does it take place? Um, we need to know, but we don't need to know as again, we don't need to know the details of the enzymes uh, like polymerase, DNA polymerase. We don't need to know those enzymes that are controlling this process. And we need to know why is it important for DNA to be replicated. Okay, so why do we have it? Okay, so what is it? DNA replication is when DNA makes a replica of itself. It makes a copy of itself. It makes two identical copies of the same DNA, and it happens during the phase of interphase. Now, you would have heard about interphase before. Interphase is what we find during mitosis, but we're also going to find it during meiosis my hosts as well. Um, and when we talk about interphase, technically it's not actually part of mitosis or meiosis. That's why we call it interphase. It's in between phases of meiosis or mitosis. Uh, but the, uh, and 90 percent of a cell's life is spent in interphase. Okay, so interphase, that's when replication does happen. Interphase is actually separate from mitosis or meiosis, and these stones also duplicate uh, during replication. Now, if we take a look at a long string of DNA, um, and we take a look at the DNA, the DNA is curled up around little um, proteins called the stones. This just makes help compress the DNA a bit better. And so when we are going through replications, these stones will also replicate. They will also duplicate because again, I need something to, it's like a ball of string that I curl around um, a, a ball um, that I roll around a ball. And those, that, that ball is called a new stone and it's made out of uh, proteins. And the two identical units called chromatids are formed and are held together by a centromere. Okay, so, when we take a look at DNA, you can see I'm going to um, give you a chance now, Ruan. Um, so we can see the DNA is wrapped around these little balls called histones. And when we, when we curl them up, we can either get them inside of the chromatin network, which will form the nucleolus, or when we're going to replicate, we're going to form what we call these uh, replicated chromosomes, replicated chromosomes that are ready to divide or are getting ready to, to go into cell division, either mitosis or meiosis. And then we simplify the drawing by drawing it this way. Okay, Ruan, you had a question? Yes, sir. Doesn't the chromosome before replication already have a centromere? 
Okay, the chrome is the centrum, yeah. No, be careful because there's a confusion about words that's gonna happen here. Remember that when we're gonna take a look, and especially when we get my houses, I'm gonna get two different um, I'm gonna get two different objects that sound very simple similar. I'm gonna get a, what we call a centromere, and the centromere is this one. That's the centromere. It holds the two strands of my replicated chromosome together. We call each strand, if they are in this chromosome, we call them a chromatid. Okay. And then we're also going to have something else that we call a centrihole. centrihole. The centrihole also has another name. Um, it's called a uh, centrosome. centrosome. Um, and these are they, they're almost almost synonyms of one another, but there is a difference between the two. You guys don't need to know the difference. Please do not confuse. Be careful. Do not confuse the the word centromere with centriole or centrosome. These are two separate things. Okay. Um, when we when we take a look, let me just get another slide. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask, um, just before the, um, yes. the chromosomes replicate, it's going to mm. be one chromatid and a centromere. And then when replicate, it becomes yes. two uh, Unreplicated, basically we call that an unreplicated chromosome. Okay, so okay. Um, I'm going to draw some here now. Okay, so basically what we get is we get a chromatin network. And this chromatin network is in in the nucleus, so if this is the nucleus, that's the nuclear membrane, okay? And the nuclear membrane, and then we got some strings normally sticking out here, um, which are your chromatin network, and they will go out and they'll go back into the uh, nucleolus, go back and go into the nucleus. And and this basically, this is, this is now where we're going to get our, um, our replication to happen. So what's going to happen instead of just one string, we're going to form two of them. But as soon as we form two of them, what's going to happen is you first have the one, and this is what we call an unreplicated chromosome. And then we're going to double up on it. We're going to make two of them. And they're going to be exact copies of one another. Okay, so then we have two of them, and this is now a replicated chromosome. So Unreplicated hasn't replicated, hasn't gone through DNA replication yet. And replicated chromosome, um, that is now one that has made a copy of itself and it's joined together with a what we call the centromere. And then during any cell splitting, mitosis or mitosis, these two are going to split from one another. So they're going to split up and then we're going to call them daughter chromosomes. So unreplicated chromosomes, there's just one of them. Unreplicated, then they make a double copy. Then it's replicated chromosomes. So replicated chromosomes, there's two of them. There's a, um, and each of them are called chromatids. But as soon as they split, as soon as during cell division, the, the centromere splits, we then call it a daughter chromosome. We don't call it a chromatid any longer. Then it's a daughter chromosome. And then each of them is going to go into a, a separate cell. Each will go into a separate cell in the end. Okay, so that's basically the yes, replication. Yes? Uh, sir? Hmm. Why isn't the unreplicated DNA um, drawn with the centromium? Okay, uh, because for, for, for DNA to do its job, it needs to be in long strings. Now remember, uh, if we, we go back to last week's lessons, one of the things that the DNA is, it provides a code, and the code provides then a, um, a, a map for the proteins that are gonna form. And unfortunately, what happens is when the long string of DNA is in this form, or even in that form, inside the nucleolus, it cannot do its job. It needs to be taken out of the filing cabinet, it needs to be drawn out, and I must be able to read the whole code for protein synthesis, which uh, needs to happen, which we'll cover in one of the next, next few lessons. Uh, so, and 
it cannot it can only do its job if it can if it can go out in a long string not when it's called up into the chromosome so it's called up into the chromosome the only job is for it to get ready for the vision so i can divide it into two separate cells it cannot do protein synthesis if it's part of the chromosome I just want to also yes, take sir. guys back to um, a, a grade 10 lesson or a grade um, 9 lesson. Um, so remember when we took a look at a cell and the cell had a nucleus and the nucleolus and one of the one of the organelles was was then called the centrihole, centrihole and also also called the centrosome. That's fine if you call it a centrosome. And this helps in cell division. Please don't confuse that with the centromere. You'll see where the function is when we get back to uh, just recapping on mitosis and then going into mitosis. Okay. <clears throat> so I wanted to ask though, yes. when you drew the unreplicated DNA, you drew it without a centromere. I thought yes. that when you draw the one chromatid, there should also be a centromere attached to it. Okay, no, when it's on its own, the centromere is not going to be uh, the centromere is not going to be visible. You will only so it see forms the, only when it's replicated. Mm, you'll see um, only when it's a replicated chromosome. You'll see the centromere. All right, so thank you. Okay, okay, so uh, let's go. Let's take a look at DNA now. Now we we're splitting DNA now and looking at it like it looks like. Um, and there we can see that uh, we know that it's a double helix from the previous lesson. And when we unwind that double helix, it basically forms a ladder. And this ladder can split down the middle like this. And then when it splits down the middle, it actually separates. And then because the base pairing is complementary, I uh, attaches to T, T to A, C to G, and G to C's, we can then make two copies, two copies of the single strand. So it was one strand previously, with loose nucleotides, it will now form two strands. But there's a very important two processes that happen here before we can start forming the two strings from one string, is we need to remember that for that to happen, I need to firstly unwind, unwind the, the whole thing. Um, and then I need to unzip it. Okay, so I need to zip it open. I need to, I need to stretch it into two strands to be able to, to make space for new nucleotides to come in. And I cannot unzip it if I don't unwind it. And you guys need to be careful of that because if you, if you swap those two words around and you say unzip before unwind, I can't unzip if I haven't unwound my DNA. I need to unwind my DNA so it forms a ladder instead of a spiral and then I can unzip it. Then I can split, I can tear the two strings apart. So basically the DNA helix unwinds, the DNA now looks like a ladder and then the weak hydrogen bonds between, between the um, two strands they break and then free floating nucleotides, free DNA nucleotides then start and adding themselves to the current strings that are now split. And then it forms two strands where we used to have one. Now there's a lot of um, extra detail that goes on here because one of the things that happen is that um, DNA can only be replicated in a single direction and not in, um, but you don't know, have to know a lot of those detail. All that you have to know is it's controlled by enzymes and then um, that one, one string actually forms quicker than the other string. So we have a leading strand and we have a lagging strand. And in the lagging strand, what we find, and you can go watch the other videos with that detail if you just want to know it for interest, is that we have to actually um, form them and then bond um, and then put them together afterwards to make a proper strand. And unfortunately, a lot of mutations can happen when when that process takes place. Okay, so each strand is a template for the complementary strand to form, and two identical copies are formed from the original DNA from the original strand. So let's take a look at the strands over here. 
So here's my original strand. Let's take a look at this side. It says G A T G G A. Okay, so when I form the other side, it needs to form also G A T G G A. You see, it's the same. And this side, C T A C C T. Okay, so this side needs to be C T A C C T. Yes, it's the same. So that one and that one is the same. That one and that one is, sorry, that one is the same and so this one and just get my colors right here this one and this one is going to be the same and that one and that one is going to same. so in the end you end up with two strings that look like the original string because of complementary base pairing because g always connects to c and a will always connect to t and that's important because it carries a code and when I make a copy, I want to have an exact copy. And when that exact copy doesn't happen, we call it mutations. And we're going to talk a little bit more about mutations later in this section of work. Is when this DNA replication goes wrong. And what, what are the consequences if the DNA replication goes wrong? So remember, I need to unwind my DNA. I need to unzip my DNA. I need three nucleotides to make complementary base pairs to each side of the original DNA string. So from one string, I'm gonna get two strings and the strings need to look exactly the same. Okay, so what's the importance of replication? Okay, so during my uh, mitosis one, uh, the mother cell divides into two daughter cells and DNA must be identical in both. Daughter cells must have the same genetic info as the original mother cell, and that's what we want. When we're producing more cells, I need all of my cells to have the same DNA and to be on the same page in terms of their functioning. And so that's why we have DNA replication. Okay, so can I ask, before I go into, um, into the next lesson, if there's any question, into the next lesson of um, DNA profiling, if there's any questions. Okay, let me just quickly check the chat box as well. Okay, no questions in the chat yet. Guys, as we go along and you think of questions, please feel free to, to put it in the chat box. Okay, let's go on to DNA profiling. Okay, DNA replication is quite easy. Let's go into DNA profiling. There's lots of application questions when we're going to go into DNA profiling. Um, but, and, but I want you to be very careful, especially if you watch a lot of TV shows, especially if you watch a lot of like CSI and those crime shows, and not to confuse uh, certain of these phrases with some of the layman's terms that we are using. DNA profiling or DNA fingerprinting is not the same as DNA sequencing. DNA sequencing is a step up and DNA sequencing is when I can actually get a full, uh, a full code from um, all the A's and the C's and the T's and the G's in sequence and I can actually see what it looks like for a single human being and, uh, or animal and it's a lot more complicated to do. It takes a lot longer. It's a lot more costly. DNA profiling or fingerprinting, and while I'm using that word fingerprinting, please don't ever use it again. Uh, we commonly say DNA fingerprinting, but we don't use that word. They don't like that word in the exams, so stick to the word DNA profiling. Don't use the word DNA fingerprinting. Okay, okay so uh, what do we need to know about DNA fingerprinting? Okay, I need to know what is the definition of a DNA profile. I need to know how I can use it and I need to be able to interpret a DNA profile. And we're gonna go through some examples here today. Okay, so this is typically what we see when we have a DNA profile or fingerprint, and you can see those aren't A, C's, T's, or G's. I cannot get, take that code and turn it into A, C's, T's, or G's. But what this is, is that when we take a look at a long string of DNA, I'm gonna get what we call random repeats, especially in the non-coding part of the DNA. 
So if I make a, 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 a just a small section of DNA here and I say this is A, T, G, C, A, C, T, C, T, A, A, a T, G, a, C, A, C, G, G, C, and then I get another A, T, G. Now, now you see something happen here. You see, okay, here's an A, T, G, there's an A, T, G, there's an A, T, G, and that's what we call a random guess. There's a question. Yeah. Masharu, I, th I think you, I think that your internet signal might be a bit um, unclear. Can, can you put your question in the chat, please? Okay, then I'll try and I'll try and answer it. Okay. Can Mashari, put your put your question in the chat, um, and then I'll try and answer it afterwards. Your your internet signal is a bit slow. Okay. Okay. So these are called random repeats. Okay, and depending on the number of random repeats I get in my non-coding non-coding part of my DNA, we can actually get these lines and. There's actually a video on Google Classroom that shows you how they go through the electrophoresis to get these lines. They actually send a voltage through it. And then they split the DNA random repeats up and they get these little lines, which, which is like a fingerprint. That's why they call it fingerprint, which is like a fingerprint for your DNA. Okay, so they extract the DNA from body cells. Then the DNA is prepared by a, um, in a barcode type pattern that they get through electrophoresis. And patterns match the sequence of base pairs from both parents. The barcode is seen as the DNA profile of fingerprint and people share most of their genetic material, except for these random repeats. There's a lot of random repeats and we, it's common random repeats, but we get uh, that we have different amounts of these random repeats. Uh, one of you might have 20 ATGs and I only have 10 ATGs. And depending on that, I can get one bar of Okay, now, non-coding parts of DNA differ. This um, is used for profiling and each person has a unique DNA profile, except for DNA twins, which has um, the same profile. So this is how we use it. We can use it in crime solving. And, uh, we can use it for, as forensic uh, evidence in court. Non-coding parts of the DNA differ. This part uh, is used for DNA profiling and each person has a unique DNA profile. Um, let's take a look. We can get DNA from skin, blood, saliva, from hair, from many other things on a crime scene, for example. Let's take a look at what happened here. Okay, so over here, we've typically got a DNA profile. We've got the victim and we've got the DNA profile of the victim. And we can see there's her bars. There's the bars, there's the bars. Take a look at the position of the bars. Okay, then. I found some blood over here on the crime scene and from the blood I could get some DNA and over here I can see there's the bars for the for uh, the, the uh, whatever blood came from the one of the suspects. Okay. So now I need to match up and I need to now correlate and see who matches. Okay. Ah, suspect two. There's already a problem. And again, suspect two and suspect one and suspect three. Okay, so that tells me nothing. Then I go through the third one, um, suspect one counts, suspect two counts, suspect three, that, so that tells me nothing. Then there's no match over here with suspect three, so I can almost eliminate that. Uh, there's again, another match with suspect two. Now I can see it's most likely suspect two. And then I go to the next one and it matches one and two. Okay, one and two. But again, two is the most likely because he's got more bars that match. This bar does not match that. And then the last bar matches. So most likely the culprit was suspect number two. And so you can see why they call it a fingerprint. You actually take it out and you, you sort it out and you match the fingerprint or you match the DNA profile with uh, between uh, whatever source of DNA you have and the suspect, okay? And so that's how we do DNA profiling. 
and it's very common to ask a question like this in the in the exams okay let me check the chat now you said um we'll take a look at just okay i still don't see any questions uh just mashari i couldn't hear you a moment ago so please if you want to ask your question just put it into the chat please okay now people so uses of dna profiling we can use it to identify any crime suspects and in a forensic investigation we can prove paternity uh, now paternity is a, a, a big one because you need to remember that you get half the dna from mommy and you get half the dna from daddy and so with the with paternity testing what we need to do is we need to match up uh, whatever dna profile you have with mommies and whatever is not the same will have to match that with daddy that has to match with daddy okay non-coding i don't understand okay so that's that's a very good question thank you for asking sorry okay so what we have with non-coding dna is that when we take a look at dna and i'm just going to draw a random dna a t g c c a c c g a G. Okay, a section of this DNA is going to code, we call it a gene, is going to code for a protein. So a gene will code for a protein. But most of our DNA, 90% of our DNA doesn't code for anything. It's just, it is just there. Okay, and it doesn't code for any genes, doesn't code for any proteins, doesn't give any message through and so those we call the non-coding parts. The non-coding, those parts of your DNA, we call non-coding parts of your DNA. So there's, uh, we, they, you actually used to call it junk DNA. Junk DNA, uh, but we don't call it junk DNA because anymore there is a function to it, but it doesn't code for any proteins. It's not part of the genes. 90% of your DNA actually codes for nothing. And so we call it non-coding DNA and 10% codes for what we call a gene and codes for specific proteins. Okay. Now, uh, we can also with DNA profiling determine probability and causes of genetic defects. Okay, so we can take a look at uh, probably um, in the DNA whether somebody would, is likely to get things like cancer, uh, and so forth and then we can trace missing people if we have dna resources and we can actually match them to family and match them with family to see if they are related and we can establish compatibility of tissue types for organ transplants using dna okay so here's a, another example and i'm going to give you guys some more examples in the next few lessons that you can practice this okay there's mommy there's mom and there's uh, baby. Now, we try to see who's the dad. Now, what's gonna happen is if I take a look at um, mommy and I take a look at, uh, at the child, if the, if the child doesn't match mommy, so over there, it doesn't match mommy, so it has to match dad. Okay, so we have to take it across and that one has to match dad because it's not matching mommy. So now it's either dad two or dad three. Let's go to the second one. Okay, second one over here matches mommy. So I'm not even gonna look on the side of daddy because I know DNA for that specific one was achieved from mommy, not from daddy. Okay, then we go to that one. And that also matches up with mommy. So I'm not even going to take a look at that one. That matches with mommy. I'm not even going to try to match daddy. If this one doesn't match mommy, so it has to match daddy. So now dad one applies and dad three applies. But now I already see a pattern for me here. In the previous one, we, um, uh, dad three already had a previous one that matched. Um, but dad two only had one and then one only had one let's take a look at the next one this one has to match someone over there and then doesn't match mommy and so it has to match daddy so it's matching that two but that also matching that three 
So the most likely daddy is dad three because that one matches mommy. So we can't even use that one. So the most likely one to be daddy is actually dad number three because he's got three matches more than any of the other ones. There's also a likelihood that if we take a look at dad two and dad three because they have some matches between them, that these two can be brothers because there's some matches in between them that are the same. And that is quite common. We even have that one over here. I'm gonna show you that one. There's another match between dad two and dad three, but it doesn't match um, the baby. Um, but that means that these two can actually technically, because if we take a look at their DNA that's matching, it's, it's good likely that they're brothers or that they are family because there are some matches. But the most likely dad is dad number three because he's got the most matches that don't match mom. So I always go with this and I match with mom first and then whatever doesn't match mom, we then match that to, to dad and see if it matches that because your DNA is a combination between mom's DNA and dad's DNA. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so here's a, a similar scenario and I've already divided the colors for us here. Okay, so this there's child and mom that matches, child and mom that matches, child and mom matches there, child and mom, child and mom. Okay, so what are we left with here? We are left with this one. So there's a match over there, there's a match over there, there's a match over there. None of them are matching male number two. There's another match over there, and there's another match, and it matches that. That's the only one that matches male number two, and there's another match over here. So one, two, three, four, five, six matches with name number two. Male number two, congratulations, you are the daddy. Okay, let's take a look at this one. This is typically what a real DNA profile looks like. Um, and so this could be this could be from a real uh, photograph of a DNA profile. So we found DNA samples and there was um, at the crime scene and we're gonna match them to our uh, suspects over here. So I'm just gonna pull up my highlighter here just to make it easier. Okay, let me just use a yellow here. There's a match, there's a match. That's a match to all of them. That's a match there, match there, match, that's a match to all of them. That is a big one. There's a big match there, there's a big match there. Let's take a look at that one. That's a match, that's a match, and that's not a real match. Let's take a look at that big band over there. There is a match, but it matches all the three of them. Okay, that one matches there. That one matches over there and over there. And this last one matches over there and over there. And if we count the number of matches, suspect two is most of the matches. But let's stop there now and let's discuss this. Now, it's suspect two. His DNA was found at, at the crime scene. Does that make him the criminal. No, we don't know what happened. That we still got to interpret. It doesn't just say because he was at the crime scene that he was the one that did something wrong. It just tells us that at some stage he was at the crime scene. Also, we must think about the fact that when we do these DNA profiles, in the lab, things can go wrong. So in the lab, things can go wrong. Human interpretation can also be wrong. Okay, so just because there's a DNA match doesn't always mean that it's going to be correct. Human fault, human error, lab error, lots of things can happen. And we must also remember that. Okay. Okay, guys, I posted these activities. I want you guys to complete these activities and then do, um, do them. Uh, just that one activity, just that one question, okay? 
Uh, let's go into the DNA profiling. Uh, why it's positive, why it's negative. Okay, so why, what's the positives coming out of DNA profile? I can prove paternity. Okay, so I can prove if someone's the daddy. I can trace a lost relative or separated siblings. I can ID a missing person. If I have um, family DNA, I can ID the remains of victims of accidents. If I have DNA from family or previous DNA samples, I can detect uh, probably genetic defects, which means that I can help treat cancer before it even starts. I can use it as forensic evidence and I can ID the origins of products like, uh, for example, the illegal trading, uh, like poaching of species. Um, I can actually get DNA of rhinos and match to the area where they came from. Why, 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 what is some of the, the problems with it? Inaccuracy in the process, there might be errors. There is no standard for how these things are done. So there might be errors creeping in. Human error in results of interpretation. So I can interpret the wrong um, thing from getting a DNA profile, assuming that somebody was the was uh, did something wrong just because they were on the scene of a crime and their DNA was there. I can discriminate against people that are ill because they might have three, uh, they might and might know if they have, if they're gonna get cancer and I might decide, I'm not gonna employ you because you're gonna get cancer before the age of 40, or I'm not gonna insure you because you're gonna get cancer and then I have to pay for your cancer. And so that that's discrimination. A cost. People are excluded because of the cost. This is a very costly process to do. There's no uniform standards for forensic labs at the moment. DNA samples may be planted at a crime scene. So it is possible to actually plant a strand of hair or whatever at a DNA crime scene, even some skin. And some samples may be identical to suspects, especially if they're family or the other scenario is where, especially if it's identical twins. Okay. Okay, how uh, could the child be male? How do we actually DNA profile? What instruments do, I, do they use? I suggest you go to, uh, please go watch the videos that I said. They, they, they have like this big box um, that they do uh, gel electrophoresis in. And please go and watch those videos on how they do it. They actually show the physical process of how they do it. And then it's going to show you. Unfortunately, it's difficult for me to show it over a Zoom lesson or even live, uh, because I don't have that, that that type of equipment. But please, there's some nice videos that you can go watch um, that, uh, that shows you the process that I have placed on Google Classroom. If you need more, go onto YouTube and see how it works. Um, I'm not sure what your question, what you mean by could the child be a male? I don't know if I referred to the child as a female. Uh, but yes, we, uh, th this DNA profile will not tell me whether the child is a male or a female. That we have to do a full DNA sequencing for. And um, we have to check what the X and the Y chromosome is. Um, whether they have X and Y chromosomes or just X chromosomes. But no, you will not get that from a DNA uh, profiling. You can only get that from a DNA sequence. Um, you can also get it from a carrier type, which we'll discuss later when we do meiosis, but we'll leave that for a later stage. Okay, guys, we don't have much time left. What we'll do is we'll ask some, I'll answer the questions on yesterday, um, on Thursday's lesson that I've posted later. It was from the 2015 paper two, and I'll answer those two in tomorrow's lesson. I'll try to answer those in tomorrow's lesson. Is there any questions left for, that you guys want to ask? Before time is up, one minute, 50 seconds. Oh. Yes. So Martin, um, I'm learning with that and it's like a group from you. Like it's such a random group of them. I'm sorry, I cannot, I'm sorry. I, I, I hear nothing of, I'm not hearing what you, you are asking. I think your internet, I don't know if my signal slow or that, or just yours, uh, but you can, you're welcome to WhatsApp me on the group and ask the questions as well. Okay. Um, what does Dina actually prove? Dina profile actually proves do they have similar height, same hair, same nails? Okay, no. 
uh, DNA profiling cannot do any of that because all of DNA profiling um, actually matches for non-coding DNA. And when you talk about similar high or similar hair or similar nails, that will all form part of coding DNA, not non-coding DNA. That's all coding DNA. All that it proves is that you were or you weren't somewhere or you are a match to family. And so because it's all part of the non-coding part of DNA. To get things like height, similar nails, same hair, for that, for that, we're gonna need DNA sequencing. But go watch the videos on Google Classroom, on the grade 12 Google Classroom, lesson four, and you might understand a bit better. Okay, thank you guys. Um, the lesson is about to run out the time. Uh, thank you, and we'll continue tomorrow. And feel free to post questions on the WhatsApp group, and then I'll answer them.